Welcome everyone and good morning. Can everyone hear us okay? Perfect. If that changes, just give us a holler. Um, so thank you again for joining us today and choosing our session on bridging the gap between the nursing and biomedical departments. Again, my name is Leo Goldberg and I've been an operating room nurse here in Connecticut for 13 years. And my name is Cassandra Eilers. I'm the nursing professional development practitioner with 10 years of operating room experience. So we have nothing to disclose and the views we will share today are our own. These are our three objectives today. We wanna to understand the need for collaboration between perioperative nurses and the biomedical engineers that we work so closely with. We wanna describe elements of effective communication and then bring this all together by discussing opportunities to bridge the gap between perioperative nurses and biomedical engineers. We wanna make sure that we are highlighting the importance of mutual respect communication and collaboration. We're going to start our talk about sharing some of the frustrations and real world challenges we experience in our profession. But we want to acknowledge that we are sharing opportunities for successful collaboration and we have a true appreciation of having biomedical engineers as a resource at our facilities. As perioper perioperative nurses, we want to dive deeper into the importance of collaboration between the perioperative teams and biomedical engineering department. Although we will talk about specifics related to our field, many of these themes can be applied to other patient care environments. Are you familiar with the perioperative department? It's composed of the pre-op, intra-op, and recovery room areas. Our focus today is on the intra-op or operating room environment. This is the restricted area where surgery takes place. As I mentioned, I've been an operating room nurse for many years. My number one responsibility as that OR nurse is to be the patient advocate. Nurses ensure patients receive high quality, safe, correct, and complete care. We do this through specialized knowledge of detailed assessment and documentation, endless sterile supplies and instrumentation, surgeon-specific preferences, infection prevention protocols, safe patient positioning, and all those different machines. Though we care for one patient at a time, we are responsible for being aware of the overall workflow of cases in our department and anticipate how our resource utilization can affect those around us. Besides direct nursing care, we work closely in collaboration with many professions at the bedside. We support the needs of the surgeons, the anesthesia team, the PAs, surgical technologists, residents, radiology techs, perfusionists, to name just a few. We must understand each other's roles and how we can support each other through our shared goal of successful surgical outcomes. The constant demands on the team is a well choreographed dance, but at times includes the best improvisation that experience can provide. And when there is a misstep, this can cause increased stress on the team prolong surgical time for the patient or harm the patient or a team member. In order for our department to run smoothly, we are supported by and work closely with many other departments, including central sterile processing and of course, biomedical engineering. The perioperative department is technology and equipment reliant. There are machines we use on a daily basis and those that we use only once or twice a year. But we are responsible for storing, moving and knowing how to use each one. And I'm sure you might be familiar with some of these. There's monitoring equipment, warming equipment, imaging machines, lasers and electrocautery, SCD machines, cameras, tourniquets, suction machines, robots, to name just a few. The list goes on and on. I'm not an expert in technology, and therefore in order to care for my patients, I rely on you to make sure the equipment is in good working order and correctly maintained in order to provide safe patient care. And our collaboration can continue in many ways. Today, we want to address the importance of that working relationship between perioper perioperative nurses and biomedical engineers. To begin, we have the shared goal of ensuring medical equipment is safe to use and readily available. Nurses depend on biomedical engineers to maintain and calibrate critical devices like those anesthesia machines, surgical robots, and monitors. You can see here in this photo, the green sticker on this IV fluid warmer is a way that our biomed team clearly communicates to the frontline staff 
that the assessment of the equipment is up to date and ready for safe use. This can also prevent downtime. I spoke earlier of the role of anticipation and perioperative nursing care responsibilities and having regularly maintenance equipment helps reduce any equipment failures. Not having the appropriate equipment available can increase stress on the OR teams, cause surgical delays, and negatively affect patient care. Second, we must work together to include appropriate and regular training on correct and safe use of equipment. The resources of real-time support is important to ensure staff and patient safety, especially for high-risk and infrequently used devices. Additionally, it can be challenging when a device stops working at the time of use. Training on basic troubleshooting can prevent patient care delays and staff frustrations. For example, an SCD machine with an error message may just need to be turned off and turned back on. This easy step saves me a call to Biomed and prevents the need for interrupting their workflow. Other times, a more serious error may occur that needs immediate technical support. When that complicated anesthesia machine stops working in the middle of the case, we need a response from our biomed team right away to make sure that that patient on the table is safe. We can work together to understand quick fixes at the point of use that can minimize wait times leading to optimization. For example, I found that I always had to call biomed when the light went out on a microscope. There was a delay in care as the procedure was paused to wait for biomedical engineers to, to arrive and troubleshoot. In conversation, I learned that there was a spare bulb housed within the microscope that it just took a quick moment to switch the two over. I asked for a quick lesson, passed the information on to the rest of the room level staff, and this extra knowledge enhanced patient safety by reducing the surgical delay and helping to get the patient out from under anesthesia sooner. It helped to free up the biomed team from having to traverse half the hospital just to change a light bulb. And now they can replace the blown bulb at their convenience. Third, working together, we can create some wonderful solutions to the challenges within our clinical tasks, but that can't happen if we don't communicate with each other. Real-time feedback from nursing helps engineers improve designs. One of my favorite experiences is when the product engineers are on site to gather feedback from the end users. The ability to share challenges the end users face to the person that can actually make changeable, tangible change in the product is so empowering. Many times frontline staff are not brought to the table at beginning of designs and this can create a challenge downstream from misunderstanding of the equipment. Through eliciting feedback we can close these gaps in product misuse and enhance the efficiency and safety of the equipment we put to use each day. Additionally, facility biomed engineers can assist in modifications that can support the frontline staff and our nursing workflow. As we instituted the use of surgical smoke evacuators across our system, biomed helped to design the carts that house these generators. We partnered to share the needs of dual units in four of our rooms as we had many of our breast surgeons working in tandem a very unique opportunity. Rather than needing to find space and outlets for two individual carts each time, which was a greatly limiting our already cramped operating space, our biomed team was able to fashion one cart that housed all four pieces of equipment. This simple fix had a huge impact. As another example, when we opened a new orthopedic center, our biomed team was successful in enhancing one cart to house the necessary electrocautery unit, SCD machine, smoke evac generator, tourniquet machine, and even added a basket for soft storage supplies for us. Importantly, they had put an outlet power strip on the cart to maintain individual pieces plugged in. And if we had to move the cart around, we only had to unplug one cord. This saved us a tripping hazard and also was better for safety. And lastly, it's important for us to have interprofessional collaboration because it provides opportunities for improved, to improve our shared goals of safe patient care and improving patient outcomes. This is a joint responsibility. Many of the devices we use are complex and when broken or used inappropriately can cause safety hazards. Technology is constantly evolving because surgery is constantly evolving. We must work together to stay up to date and informed. As technology evolves, it's a beautiful thing. 
but even the best can cause frustrations to arise. Our fast pace and at times rough on equipment environment can keep biomed a little busy, maybe a little too busy and at a high cost. I've gotten feedback at times that questions how we continue to break equipment and feel like we are directly blamed as if these are intentional actions. Speaking for myself, I understand the importance of having expensive, delicate equipment available at all times. But in the moment when prioritizing multiple asks from room staff, some being more patient than others, being gentle is not always the top focus. Also, accidents happen, and sometimes there are flaws in the equipment design for real world use. For example, when moving quickly and at top times in odd movements, like under the drapes or around the base of a surgical table, proper ergonomics might not be used. And the most correct way of handling a piece of equipment can be difficult. On the screen here, you see a picture of the bipolar pedal placement before the surgery starts. Adjusting said pedal after it's fallen off that step stool and away from the surgeon's foot Blocked by all the staff standing in front of it in the middle of surgery can be physically challenging. And of course, it needs to be done immediately to prevent a bleeder. It's like playing twister, trying to get under the bloody drapes, avoid the fluids on the floor, over the base of the bed, stretch through the surgeon's legs, all to reach the pedal just to move it a few inches. Sometimes you just have to give up and pull on that cord. I understand this action can cause it to fray and I don't wanna make excuses. I have a responsibility to try to care for the equipment and try to be mindful whenever I can. But you can understand about the above example can be very challenging. In other examples, IV poles might get bumped or floating lights migrate on their arms and crash into screens and monitors. OR table heights are adjusted during surgery and a patient warmer is forgotten underneath. Carts are pushed out of the way of the patient bed and get caught on cords. Fluids get into places they really shouldn't. And other events happen in which you think you really can't make this stuff up. When you get that call for broken equipment, my request is that you don't get frustrated with staff immediately. But understand that not everything can be done by the book at all times. I stress this is not to belittle my job or yours, but just to give you a little insight into my struggles that unfortunately affect you. Here's an opportunity for future collaboration to solve challenges. And here's a success story. We now have plastic covers on all our TVs because we replaced quite a few of them after IV poles went crashing. I wanna share a couple other challenges that I face on a daily basis in my job as a perioperative nurse that might provide me the opportunity to work with my friendly biomedical engineers. There are usually a lot of moving parts to machines and equipment, and some are very fragile, which if you ask me is really poor design when you understand the fast paced environment of the operating room where there truly are so many moving pieces of equipment, drapes covering areas and people moving around. Touch screens and monitors are banged into with that heavy equipment that we talked about and unbalanced carts can tip over when quickly moved out of the way for patient care especially when they hit those cords. Hydraulics on beds can blow, indicator lights break off, and handheld controllers are dropped. Many of these scenarios require a fix by Biomed. Let's talk about storage. That looks like a pretty organized closet, right? Some equipment lives in each room, but others are limited in number and travel from room to room. We put many ma machines on a cart, a table on wheels, or an IV pole. Some move around on their station and other machines are moved from surface to surface. But bringing machines back and forth from the place of use to a storage location in the department leaves the opportunity for damage. I have had the generator boxes almost fall off that cart when the wheels get stuck on something like a power cord on the floor. And I appreciate when devices are well secured, carts are easy to maneuver and stability is maintained. You can see in this picture, the orange generator is secured with a Velcro safety strap, patient safety strap. Sometimes we just need to use a little ingenuity. I dream of a wireless OR. I'm just saying. But let's be real. Depending on the design of an OR, sometimes there just aren't enough plugs or they are not in the ideal location. 
This can lead to poor placement of power cords along the floor, as you can see. Besides being a tripping hazard for the staff, we can cause damage to the cords themselves. One of the most common calls to my biomed support team is for frayed cords damaged either from being pulled, having equipment wheeled over it, or engaging a bed break on it, as you see from the picture with the arrow. And speaking of flaws in design, the grounding pin in a three plug constantly breaks off in the outlets. I need to call my biomed team a lot to get some pliers. And I wanna reiterate, technology is constantly evolving. New surgical techniques aided by new machines and specialty OR beds help improve patient outcomes. And it usually becomes the responsibility of the nurse to troubleshoot any device not working correctly. Some are intuitive and some are not. Some errors can be clearly uh, cleared simply by restarting, and I'm really good at that one, but sometimes not so much. And of course, it's always helpful when multiple very patient providers are staring at you in the middle of surgery, unable to continue until I figure out the problem and an immediate fix. So sometimes I can get a different machine if available, and other times I need biomed right away. So there are many different types of equipment in the OR and several environmental alarms that will go off when there is a change in gas pressures, temperature, or even electricity use. And Biomed is not responsible for everything with a power source or an error code. Again, I am not the expert on who to call every time. My go-to is Biomed. For example, when the computer system integrated into my room freezes and the surgeon's favorite Katy Perry song stops playing, I know I know my biomed hero will quickly respond and restart the system at the server. If he can't solve it, he'll let me know to call IT. I appreciate when biomed nicely responds very quickly, checks out the situation, sh shares their expertise in the moment, and then directs me to which department to call after them. This helps me learn appropriate resources for the future and sometimes simply understand that it's safe to proceed despite the scary alarm. In summary, I trust you to solve my problems and you respond, so I call you for everything. Thank you for all that you do. You ensure I have valuable resources to safely care for our patients. At this time, I'd like to pass it over to Cassandra. Thank you, Leah. Okay, so we'll transition to a little talk about communication. And I wanna begin with a review on the foundational parts of communication. So since it's a fundamental aspect in all of our lives. It's important to understand how the different parts of communication ensure that our message is both delivered and understood. The three main parts of communication would be the sender, the message, and the receiver. The variability of the effect of communication is then dictated by the channel that we choose and the feedback that's provided. So what do I mean by that? So first, the sender is the one who initiates the communication. They are the ones that are conveying the information, the emotions, any ideas as well. It's important for the sender to be clear about the message that they want to be delivering. Next, we have the message itself. So this is really the core of our communication. Whether it's verbal, written, or nonverbal, the message itself needs to be concise, accurate, and tailored to the audience. The channel is the medium through which the message is sent. So it could be face-to-face, -face, an email, a phone call, or even through the use of body language. Choosing the right can channel is key. When there's an urgent need, the message is going to best be delivered verbally while, and in person, while less urgent updates would work well through a written note or an email. And this is due to the fact that we've got research showing that over 70% of our communication is made up in the form of nonverbals. So our gestures, our body movements, our eye contact, and our vocalics. So our pitch, volume, and rate of speech. All of that plays a very big part in the communication cascade. So when we communicate through the written format, we're losing a lot of the nuance that goes into the message and what we're trying to deliver with the words themselves. So we also have the receiver. So they're the ones that interpret the message. It's the success of the communication is going to depend on how well that receiver 
understands the sender's intent and active listening is gonna be crucial here. It's going to help us avoid any misunderstandings. Finally, we have our feedback, which I find is probably the most important part of our communication. This is the response from the receiver that tells the sender whether the message was understood. The feedback will ensure that the communication is a two-way process and not just a one-time transmission. So to review, our effective communication involves an intentional sender, a clear message, the appropriate channel, an engaged receiver, and meaningful feedback. Mastering these basic parts help us connect more effectively and efficiently in our everyday lives with others, um, as well as in our personal lives. Um, let's run through an example, right, of the communication cycle between nurses and our biomed professionals. So the nurse would be the sender in this example, and they'll be using the channel of a phone call, um, verbal message to be able to get to our receiver that is the biomedical engineer. The message itself will be that a piece of equipment isn't working correctly. So biomed will then be responsible for the feedback at this point, right? Yep, I understand you have a piece of equipment that's not working correctly, um, but could you give me a little bit more context as to what's going wrong with the piece of equipment? Um, could you let me know what I need to do to be able to assist you with this problem? And so the cycle begins again. So this would be the next phase of the cycle when we have the nurse responding to our friendly biomed engineers. We don't know for sure, but the biomed is something like this. Yeah, I think the biomed is this. So, right, that was, that was a message, right? It was sent, you know, but that's incomplete that's funny but no it's not a good message to be sent so how really is our sender struggling to put together this message we can think about some of the challenges that our nurses um, have is maybe they don't completely understand the complexity of the machine and therefore they're not able to articulate what the exact problem is to be able to get you the information that you need this is an opportunity for the biomed team to be able to provide some uh, feedback and even use some probing questions to elicit that information that's needed. We'll be touching on this a little bit more in our presentation. Another example that we have would be this sticker here, right? So how often do you see this big, bright, broken symbol on a piece of equipment walking by down the hallway? You get over there, you're really excited. All right, look at these guys taking the initiative to help me out and let me know that there's a problem and the form is blank. What, what am I supposed to do with that, right? So while it's great that they took the initiative to label the piece of equipment, it's clear, right? You know that there's a patient safety issue. You shouldn't be using this product on another piece, of, you know, on another patient, but the message itself is still unfinished. We don't know exactly what needs to be done to get this product back up and working in the department. So while you might get the notice that there is an awareness of an issue, you're not receiving enough information to know what the next step for repair would be. And that's gotta be frustrating that that's all you get for information. It's not a complete message or effective form of communication. You could be nice, you could chalk it up to, all right, maybe the nurse was very busy with all the stuff that they've got going on and this was the best that they could do in the moment. But without the feedback to the nurse to say that you're missing some key information here, the nurse is receiving the feedback that this was good communication and that cycle will continue. So feedback is key. Um, it's really where the effective communication is gonna be developed for the teams. Providing feedback to the clinical teams is gonna be a great opportunity to improve that collaboration and working together to train your staff on appropriate communication is what's needed to solve the common problems. But you don't have to do it alone. Make sure to tap into those departmental leaders to help set real ex realistic expectations in your department. So taking those two examples of communication failures, let's dive into how we struggle to communicate. So some of the challenges to effective communication are right here listed on the screen. So we've got terminology. Are we speaking the same language? So our nursing and biomed teams have very different backgrounds and strengths of focus. 
Whereas the technical jargon that's easily passed around a bunch of engineers, the nursing team might struggle with that a little bit and feel more comfortable with anatom anatomical technology and terminology. So what we wanna do is recognize, are the technical terms understood by the clinical team? And you wanna do that before you consider the process of beginning your discovery of what the root of the problem is. Also prioritization of issues. Differing priorities can cause some challenges in communication. An increase in frustration amongst our senders and receivers can occur when the priorities are unmet in a situation. So if a piece of equipment is down, the biomed team, they might be stressed about making sure that they can coordinate the correct support and testing to ensure that that piece of equipment is safe to be used um, on a patient again. And they wanna make sure that it's in line with the manufacturer's IFUs and the policies and the procedures within the facility. The nursing priorities are gonna be a little bit more uh, directly patient care focused. Are we able to get this next case up and running? Do I have enough equipment to make this doc happy? Worse yet, we know that nurses are creative and impatient. <laughs> so how many times have you guys stumbled upon some crudely constructed duct tape and chewing gum put together piece of equipment and just, I, just, I don't know. So maybe we're, maybe we're not calling because the last time I called Biomed to have this fixed, uh, it just took way too long to get back to the unit. So, you know what, I've got another case. It doesn't look like a big deal. I'm just gonna fix it myself. And oh, wow, it worked. So I'm gonna use it for my next case as well. And then I get relieved and forget to tell anybody about it. And you walk by and there's absolute chaos for the next day because nobody was able to address the problem when it was small enough to be fixed. So that's a big one. We also have lacking uh, the lack of structured communication tools. So this is another big challenge for communication. Structured tools will allow for standardization of messaging. It helps to ensure that the information needed to fix a problem is communicated and shared, and it helps reduce the, spend, the time that you guys spend hunting to understand the problem. So I got my first taste of, oh my gosh, how do you guys deal with this? Um, just this past year. We went live with a new inventory management program, and I was tasked as the clinical liaison for the frontline staff. The amount of phone calls that I got and notes on equipment and just like text messages that said, hey, it's broken, it's not working, and that was it, radio silence after that. Well, I, I can't fix it because there's 400 different reasons that it could be broken, and if I'm not fixing the problem, they're gonna stop asking me to fix the problem because they keep seeing issues. So by implementing a structured communication tool, I need this, that, and the other thing. I was able to get some information that I needed to fix a problem. They were getting their problem solved and we were moving along a little bit better. So I'm all about the structured comm tools. Another challenge that we have is managing our response time. So once a piece of broken equipment has been received, what are the next steps? Was it really broken in the first place? So you wanna make sure you're communicating to the department when it's been fixed and if it's been returned to the unit or if they need to come pick it up. Providing some real-time feedback and updates on how long it's been out of service can help our department uh, prioritize what to do for their patient care needs. Again, recognizing what their prioritization is to be able to support that communication. Providing this transparency to the process will let them understand what's going on on your end of the road. Okay, awesome. So we've just discussed those challenges of prioritizing issues, managing response time, and the lack of structured tools as significant communication barriers. Um, but in addition to these, we also have communication breakdowns that will further complicate collaboration between teams. So particularly our shift changes, anything due to documentation discrepancies and because of language barriers, right? So. In exploring this, our shift changes are a routine of both nursing and biomedical engineers. They can also be a major source of our miscommunication. So key information about the equipment issues or maintenance schedules can be lost or misunderstood during handoff. Nurses and biomed teams often work on different shift schedules and a nurse may end a shift without seeing the same biomed personnel who started the work on the piece of equipment. This could lead to gaps in communication. And the impact here is it could result in a delayed repair or prolonged downtime of critical equipment, which would end up ultimately jeopardize our patient care. Also, we have documentation discrepancies. 
our accurate documentation in the electronic medical record or EMR, it's essential for tracking our equipment use, but discrepancies will arise when the biomed records aren't consistently integrated. So while our biomedical team members are keeping meticulous track of the updates and the um, edits to the machinery and any of the fixes, that might not make it into the electronic health record in a timely fashion. And this is often due to the biomedical teams not being the ones with the access to upload into the system. So without accurate data in the EMR, any tracing of the equipment that was used on different patients will become much harder, especially if there's a safety issue or a recall that occurs. This lack of alignment between the biomed records and the EMR will complicate the process of identifying any affected patients, delay potential interventions, and poses a risk to patient safety. Our language barriers as well um, can be hindered by, uh, the effective communication can be hindered by our language barriers. And it's going beyond just the technical terminology that I spoke of earlier. So if team members have different primary languages or communication styles, misunderstandings can, can often come up. So they may struggle to convey information clearly due to language differences, which would lead to confusion about the severity of an event or a piece of equipment malfunction. And miscommunication that's caused by these language barriers can slow down the identification and resolution of equipment problems and increase the risk of delays in care, unresolved issues, or even a safe patient safety incident if the malfunctioning equipment continues to be used due to a misunderstanding of what's going on. So I mentioned the standardized comm tools are my jam. So there's a bunch of tools out there that are available for use. Um, I'm just gonna go through a couple that are fairly well known in the nursing community. So we have the CUS tool, which is a standard communication tool that stands for concerned, uncomfortable, and safety issue. It's used to raise concerns clearly and effectively. So an example of using the scenario here where the operating room nurse notices that a camera light source is flickering intermittently during a laparoscopic procedure, they're contacting the biomedical staff and they're gonna use the CUS tool to convey their information. The phone call will go a little bit like this. Hey, I'm concerned about the surgical light in OR3. It's flickering and while it's not constant, I'm uncomfortable with continuing the surgery under these conditions. If, I would worry it would become a safety issue if the light goes out during the procedure. So in this conversation, the nurse expresses concern about the flickering light. She indicates feeling uncomfortable with the situation and highlights the potential safety issue, which prompts immediate action from the biomed staff. CUS ensures that the concern is clearly communicated, emphasizes that urgency, and focuses on patient safety. But it also leaves out a lot of information. So this might be a good tool to use for some of your newer staff or if there's a high um, risk scenario where you really need to get that uh, communication delivered quickly, but you don't have a lot of time to share the rest of the details in the moment. Gotta keep holding this. <laughs> we also have our SBAR tool, which many of you are probably familiar with as well if you work in any sort of healthcare facility. Um, SBAR, uh, stands for situation, uh, background assessment and rec recommendation. So the situation will clearly state the current issue. Our background will provide some context as to when the issue started and what's been done so far. We have the assessment explaining what the concern or the impact on the procedure is. And a recommendation will suggest what action should be taken to, be address, to address this issue. So using the same scenario of the flickering uh, laparoscopic light, the SBAR handoff would go, hi, this is Cassandra in OR3. The camera light is flickering due, during the procedure. It started about 15 minutes ago and it's happening intermittently. We've already tried adjusting the settings, but it's not resolving. I'm concerned that the flickering could worsen and compromise the visibility during surgery. It hasn't affected the procedure yet, but it's distracting and unpredictable. I recommend that you come down to OR3 as soon as possible to assess the light. We also might need to switch to backup equipment if it's not fixable during the procedure. So this method ensures that all the necessary details are communicated efficiently and action can be taken promptly. Now that we've covered a bit about our role as perioperative nurses and some of the challenges and opportunities that surround effective communication, let's look at ways to put what we've learned to use. 
Ultimately, we're all here to understand the different needs of our respective departments and identify ways to improve our partnerships. So coming into this talk, Lee and I, we were really excited to share our perspective as periop nurses. And as we've learned, communication is a reciprocal process. So we took this opportunity to meet with our respective biomedical peers at our hospitals. And this next section is gonna be a result of the brainstorming and collaboration that we uh, wanted to bring to you to provide some insights and tools to take back to your own facilities to help improve any communication and teamwork between your departments. Okay, thank you, Cassandra. So we suggest setting expectations of involved parties, including all the stakeholders in the conversation can help promote positive change and ensure the process is thoroughly mapped out with all parties considered. Frontline staff engagement and consideration at the planning and development stages can empower these end users. Buy-in and support from staff, leadership, and educators can support and promote a culture of accountability to propose changes in behaviors and processes. So we successfully use standardized processes in the operating room to help ensure appropriate workflow every time. Once you have the right people in the room and a part of the conversation, it will be helpful to work on creating a standardized process of your own. For example, a workflow for nursing to identify and report those broken pieces of equipment to the biomedical engineering team. Make sure that the design of this process is one of collaborative efforts. Identify any current barriers for receipt of this information and work together to compromise on solutions that lead to success for all teams. Some examples of questions to bring to the table would be, how do you want to be contacted? In other words, what channel do you prefer is used by the sender? Is it a phone call, a text message, or an email? What information do you want included in the handoff report? I was advised it can be helpful to take a picture or write down the error code for better understanding of the problem. And if this is something you want, please include it in the process. How will broken equipment be labeled and what tool will be used to communicate the details of the error? Error, do you do like CUS or SBAR or is there something else you'd like to use? Where will the broken piece of equipment be stored until it's evaluated? And who will be your point person on that unit to provide updates to and where will you return the equipment? Think about other types of expectations you can create to promote interdisciplinary collaboration. And with these standard processes, staff can help remind each other of the necessary steps when they are clearly outlined and supported by leadership. We also wanna consider the power of education. So you can be part of training and onboarding, working with the educator to set up in services and regularly meeting with our team members to promote the type of communication that you need. You wanna take time to explain the importance of completely filling out the communication tool and what details help you to do your job more efficiently. We want to make sure that you have what you need to fix the equipment and be able to return it to the department for patient use. Also building resources. What resource guides can you help create for staff and what's already out there for use? Would a bright label on the front of a piece of equipment help them remember to keep it plugged in or to turn off when not in use? We also have at the elbow education. So some of our areas, we're using QR codes on pieces of equipment. So the end user can just scan it and it pulls up a 15 second clip of the video on how to put together the machine. Um, and this micro education is becoming more and more common at the point of use. We also know that staff turnover can seem to be constant. So is there a way for you to be part of the orientation process to ensure that new staff understand the high trouble equipment efficiently and what do they need to do if something breaks? By creating that relationship up front with the new staff, they can become familiar with their resources if and when they need them. Also provide feedback on broken equipment. Was it user error caused? Maybe the educator can set up some training. You can partner with the sales rep to help remind the staff on the proper use of the piece of equipment. Or was it even broken? 
this is a common challenge for biomed engineers, I would believe. Um, how much do you feel like you're wasting your own time trying to assess a piece of equipment that isn't actually broken? So nurses, they are not trained engineers, and maybe it just needed to be restarted or reset. I also have this example from one of my friendly biomed friends. They were called down, you know, halfway across the facility. I think we've got seven buildings that are all attached. It's quite a hike. They get called down to fix um, one of the telemetry units. The first thing they do is go to check the batteries and the nurse go, don't worry, I just put some new ones in. Still checks the batteries and they're in backwards. So, right, being able to provide that feedback, yes, great job, but maybe you wanna check the, the positives and the positives and the negatives and the negatives to actually line up. That education is a way to be disseminated to staff to figure out some ways to troubleshoot at the bedside before they have to call you. Um, and finally, data doesn't lie, right? We want to use that to support your feedback. So you can track some monthly error reports on different pieces of equipment to facilitate the need for training and additional education for staff. You can track any communication breakdowns that you're finding with the different resources and tools for communication. If there's missing information, who are you going to target for re-education and follow up as, with that as well. And you can also use data to understand problems and encourage conversations for improvement. You can show trends that support further specialized education and promote awareness of cost of products. You can even suggest a different brand or type of equipment that might be considered as a replacement in the facility. There's always great opportunities to partner with the education team and your supply team as well. So please take advantage. So another way to bridge the gap is to focus on teamwork. Today, I gave you an inside look to better understand my perspective as a perioperative nurse. But when you return to your facility, engage with the units and floors to teach them about your role and better understand their struggles to promote mutual respect. Understand that maybe the clinical staff isn't out to break equipment. A culture of blame is not healthy. We need to feel empowered to speak up when there's a problem with equipment and not afraid of consequences. I referenced the mindset of one of my biomedical engineers who explained, think of it this way, these complex machines with fragile parts and high volume use needed by the clinical staff for patient care, well, they break. And that keeps the biomedical departments busy and the engineers employed. So basically, they make it, we break it, and you guys fix it. So we can do our jobs to care for patients this is a cycle that promotes teamwork. And visibility in the team is important. Show them you are an accessible part of their team. This can be done through regular rounding on the unit, attending department team huddles, which many teams have those on a regular basis, maybe once or twice a day, or just simply walk into the break room just to say hi. Again, effective communication goes both ways. Please be transparent on how long it will take to fix equipment and update the department as that timetable changes. Identify the point person in each department to ensure gets the message. Is it the manager, the charge nurse, or someone else? At my facility, we have a centralized whiteboard that can be updated with information of equipment that is unavailable or down, and a time estimate for being fixed that includes notes like replacement pieces on order or something's on back order. And this key is key because it communicates with the staff, but it doesn't work if it's not updated. And finally, providing the, that education that we just spoke about shows your dedication to the success of the team. Oh, thanks, yeah, you could do it. Okay, so earlier we discussed the CUS and the SVAR standardized tools. And like I said, there's other verified tools that are available out in the world, but you can also create your own. Here, I've customized a tool using the insight of our shared conversations with our Biomed team members and some help from my friendly AI buddy, ChatGPT. So if you need assistance from Biomed, just say please. So P stands for the product identifier, making sure you identify specifically what is the piece of equipment that's causing the issue. Maybe you need a specific number or just general laser, right? 
the L would be the location of the problem, identifying where do you need to come to get the product fixed, where was it left, and where does it need to be returned to when it's uh, completed. E for error messages. Leah had mentioned the idea of snapping a photo of the error message or capturing that specifically so that you guys know what's going on with the machine at point of use. And A, actions taken. This one was something that uh, was driven home by my biomed friends. Um, so take, for example, that light source being a problem. If they come down to fix the light source and they think that it's all hunky-dory, they're gonna start over here with problem solving. But if I don't tell them that my actions taken were to press every button and turn every knob, they're gonna end up with a very difficult time trying to fix the problem. So actions taken is definitely something that they like to hear about. Um, S is our specific description of the problem. And I would have put it higher just to kind of give us context, but it didn't really spell out anything special for me. So um, really, what is, what's going on? What's the problem? What's the, the piece of equipment on issue right now? And then E is very important as well, escalation of urgency. How badly do you need to drop everything to come and assist in the moment? Is there a patient safety issue? Is there any effect with patient care? Is there no replacement available? Etc. right? So you're more than welcome to take this tool with you for implementation at your own facilities. Um, just make sure you're touching base with your own stakeholders to identify any optimizations or edits that you might need to make to be able to make it effective within your own facilities with your teams. And we know that one of the big struggles that we have with equipment handoff is getting the nurses to actually fill out the information that's listed here. So, um, while the tool might look great on paper, it's going to take a big effort from your leadership, the biomed teams, the educators, and the frontline staff to get it implemented effectively. So one of the suggestions I have is to maybe start small, use this as a verbal communication tool rather than a written handoff. You might get a little bit more structure like that, but really whatever it is that you decide, the big thing is that you're deciding together and making a collaborative effort to make sure that you guys are both succeeding in the effective positive patient outcomes and effective patient care. Um, really, these collaborative efforts are what optimize our efficiencies within the operating room. So in conclusion, we hope that we have helped open your eyes to the importance of understanding individual roles and daily challenges to support the building of mutual respect between nursing staff and biomedical engineers to enhance our collaboration. We broke down the parts and types of communication and looked at how that affects the identification of broken equipment. To bridge the gap between clinical and biomed departments, we must embrace our shared goals and promote effective communication to facilitate teamwork.